Stories of the Saints with Shane Robinson from Fort Worth, Texas. Is that right? Correct. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, I'm Mike Barrett. Uh, this is Shane Robinson. I know the name Shane Robinson from 20 years ago, maybe, when I moved to um, Independence from Ohio. Um I don't know how. I think we've met. Your face is familiar anyway, and it could just be from social media. I don't know anymore. (laughs) It all blends together. Shane, tell me, uh, well, why are we sitting here this morning? You reached out by email this past week uh, and said that you had been listening to the podcast. I knew your name and actually was quite uh, was thrilled to get an email from you. I knew you, I think, as maybe a missionary or someone who had lived in Honduras. And I know in our church culture, that's always Uh, neat to hear those testimonies and stories but uh, tell me how you came across the podcast and 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 where that's at with you 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 had quite a list of things you wrote me in an email i'll pull those up (laughs) we discussed some of them today but go ahead introduce yourself okay um well i'm I'm shane robinson i'm an elder in the church uh grew up in the restoration um right now i would my my job kind of moves me around and so i ended up in fort worth um And the position that I hold is a, uh, I work nights a lot. And so I found myself, you know, and a lot of it's kind of computer work and, you know, I'm not really engaging with anyone in particular. So I'm by myself quite a bit. So I had an opportunity to, to listen to the podcast. I was looking for things to kind of occupy my mind while I worked and found the podcast and have found it uh, very interesting, exciting. And, and I've kind of followed some of the other links like to, um, you know, like, uh, hemlock knots and some of the other ones that you've referenced and it, it was good to hear testimonies of the saints and as well as you know the doctrinal talks that, that you guys have been having and and really you know really found myself on the same page uh on many of most i guess mostly all the issues that you've you've brought up have been i've been right there with yana so it's been it's been exciting so well <clears throat> let's get into a little bit of well first of all this is the stories of the saints, and, and these are broadcasts where people share their testimony of Jesus. So I want to do that first, and then we can maybe get into just dialogue about some of these things that you found in agreement with. Um, so tell me, were you born in the church? Um, yes. Um, my, uh, I, you know, born born and raised RLDS. Um, my, I was baptized at, at the age of eight. Um, my, my father passed away when I was four. Of brain cancer, so I was kind of just raised by my mom until I was about ten, and she remarried. Um, but have always been, in, you know, involved in the church. After 1984, with the split, you know, we went with the Restoration branches. Um, have moved around quite a bit as a, as a child, and then now as an adult with my job. So I've been in a, a part of a lot of different Restoration branches. Everything from, you know, some of the biggest to, you know people's homes with three people you know so it's been i've had a really good view of the restoration at least the restoration branch movement um, you mentioned emily siever uh she was on here and shared her testimony you were able to worship with her at some point in time yeah yeah we uh we met we, we were meeting in denver um when when i got out there there was no established branch there was a group that group of you know six people that met doing like a basically a study study group and so um, I was able to join up with, with that group and, and we had more formal services after that. Um, and then Emily, when her family moved to, to Denver area, we she looked us up and and started meeting with us as well. So I uh, spent, you know, I guess I was in I lived in Denver for about three years. So during that time, I think she was probably there maybe a year and a half of that before I moved away again. OK, but, uh, it was good. Good fellowship. I just want to stop and think this space where we're in right now this is you and i are talking we've literally this is the first words we've said to each other on air like we hit record uh, I, I i i knew of you and and in an earlier life just the name but um isn't it crazy that we can sit down right now and get to know one another with a common bond of jesus and the restored gospel and feel like we're brothers and we've been you know known each other our whole life is that crazy i it mean yeah. we're, we're having a real-time conversation uh with somebody that i've just for for all intents and purposes i've just met right and we're, we're exploring i don't know that this is probably unique i don't know that i've ever 
had dialogue well Whitney and Hemlock Knots of course uh from the LDS side but as far as the restoration I've never interviewed someone that I know so little about (laughs) (laughs) right so this is kind of fun all right so your earliest memory of Jesus what is that early testimony well um so as I mentioned my father died when I was when I was four um he had a terminal brain tumor he was 26 years old and uh, so my mom and I, you know, were alone. And at the age of eight, uh, at my baptism, um, my confirmation um, uh, was a thus say at the spirit. Uh, it was at Blue Springs before it was a restoration branch, the Blue Springs congregation. Um, and uh, I was told in that message that that I was to that that God had had heard the prayers of my mother, and that He was going to be my father. You know, because the scripture that says He's father to the fatherless. And I can testify at, you know, at 50 years old that he has been that um, just some incredible stuff in my life has, has happened. And, and he's always been right there. And so my my relationship with him is very, you know, very, I feel very close. And I'm I, you know, so thankful for everything that I have in my life and, and where where it's gone. And, you know, even the mistakes that I've made, he somehow put the pieces back together and kept kept things going. Um but anyway, I was told in that in that experience, I was told to say the scriptures, uh, particularly the Book of Mormon. Um, was told that uh, that he that I had a work to do, and that he would you know that that would be made known to me as I uh, in time. You now, and I still not one hundred percent sure what that work is. You know, I mean, I'm an elder in the church, and you know, I've done missionary work, but I feel like that hasn't happened yet. Um, you know, maybe maybe it's the whole life experience is the work. You know, but. Um, so that was kind of a, the first sort of revealment to me um, a, as a child. Um, and so I kind of grew up with that in my sort of in the back of my mind that, you know, he's definitely there and, you know, the spirit was definitely there. And um, there was no no doubt that, that you know, he's there and that uh, he loves me and loves all of us. Um, so I guess, I mean, do you kind of want me to do a life story kind of thing or what were you well, thinking? Yeah, so did you go? You went to youth camps as a young person, I, yeah. I take it. And then, um, well, yeah, so did you get married? Did you, uh, yeah, take me through, uh, take me through any early testimonies you want to share as a younger person with the Lord? Any okay. That stick out in mind? Well, so when I was, uh, when I was 13, I was attending a, a, a at Odessa Hills campground. Um, I think. It was still RLDS at the time. Yeah, it was still RLDS. I think the document kind of had just happened, and you know, we were sort of in that that period where everybody was the document eighty four. The document, right, right, nineteen eighty four. Women of the priesthood. Um, you know, I don't. We hadn't been. I don't think at that point we'd been locked out of our church yet. I attended Odessa congregation at the time, um, which is where I met John Tandy and grew up. You know, some of the early years I spent with him. Okay. Growing up. Uh, our parents were best friends, so we, I, he and I spent a lot of time playing ping pong and talking scriptures and playing on his computer and some good memories there. He told uh, me the same thing this morning. We 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 broadcast early this morning. Um, really? And uh, I mentioned that uh, I said I I, had, I think I have a voice from your past that reached out to me this week, and he said, "Oh yeah, we were like best friends for a while." And right. He thought we were still at South Chris and, and maybe living in, in. I said, "No, he's at Fort Worth. He's living in Fort Worth now." Yep. <laughs> Yeah. So this will be cool. Yeah, I'm kind of a moving target, but <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So at 13, um, I, I was at this youth camp, and this is probably the the pinnacle testimony of my life. I mean, it's really been the, you know, I mean the the you know the Lord speaking to me at my confirmation was was you know was wonderful. Um, this one here is probably this has really given me a lot of strength. You know, I've had a lot of things happen in my life, and I can tell you about those. You know. And further on, but, but in terms of chronology speaking, this is probably the one that's really grounded me um, in, in the gospel and, and the hope for, for Zion. And um, so I was attending a campfire and the um, the campfire, you know, like they always were kind of silly in the beginning and then, you know, got serious. Well, as the serious be- portion began, I, I laid back, I was behind the campfire um, in the back and I laid down on my blanket. And we were out by the, the pond area, you know, at Odessa Hills. And I laid back and my step, I, my, you know, my dad died when I was, when I was four, my mom remarried when I was 10. And so I had my stepdad there, you know, I'd only 
had him for, you know, a few, couple of years or whatever. Um, but he was there. He was a counselor at the camp. Um, and so I lay back. I'm looking up into the this, this starry night and I was praying and, you know, just wanting to know God better, wanting to, you know, grow spiritually. And I guess I really didn't have any particular questions or anything in my mind. Just just wanted to grow spiritually, wanted to figure out what my work was, um, you know, from my confirmation experience. And, and I was also praying about getting my patriarchal blessing um, and laying back. I looked up at the starry night. It was There was not a cloud in the sky. It was totally beautiful, totally clear. Well, all of a sudden, the sky just filled with clouds. It just became pure clouds. And I, and I remember laying there thinking, where did the clouds come from? They, they didn't roll in. They just were there, you know. And the clouds were, were you know, thick, bulky clouds. And all of a sudden, they, they opened up. And in, in the sky, you know, laying back, looking straight up, um, I saw a, a large personage in the middle surrounded by a big circle of smaller pers personages as well. And I perceived them to be angels. They all were, you know, bright white. I could see shapes, but I couldn't see any details of faces or anything. And then the, the person in the fit in the middle also had a bright, was also really bright, and I couldn't see his particular face. But I saw that he had his hands folded in, and he opened up his hands like he was going to like he was going to embrace me, you know, like to hug someone. And he stood there with his hands open for a minute. And then the clouds came back together. Uh, they were together for a minute, long enough for me to sort of, you know, digest what I had seen. And then they opened back up again. And I saw a, a man on a, on a staircase. And he was, um, it was a large staircase, kind of bulky, concrete looking, you know, real big marble, kind of majestic. He was on his right side of the staircase. Um, and I remember, remember being, I remember noticing that he had a, his robe was not pure white, not like an angel, you know, it was, it had stripes and color and shape and kind of made known to me, this is a, this is a normal human being, you know, and uh, he w had a beard, big silver beard. And he was walking down these stairs um, really slowly. And he was almost to the bottom of the staircase. And, um, you know, just, but I remember thinking he's really going slow. It was just really, really deliberate, slow steps down. And the class came back together. And then it all just disappeared and went back to the starry night again. And I, you know, of course, I never really had any experiences like that. You know, I had no idea what it was I really was experiencing. Can I, can I just ask, because was this, um, so would you describe this as your mind's eye and imagination? Or would you say this was physical, like you were looking at the fire or the pond and you saw it just as physical as anything else you were seeing? It, it was it was physical. I mean, I, I wow. knew I was at the campfire and I was seeing this scene happening in the sky. It was filling up the whole sky, but I I was able to, I felt my surroundings around me. So it's not, uh, not that your eyes were closed and you're imagining something, but like, like you were watching, like, like we would say a movie or a TV, like you were cognizant that you were seeing this with your physical eyes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Continue. Yeah. So I got up and I went around, you know, of course the spirit was flowing through me. I didn't really have much experience with the spirit at that point to really identify it. But, you know, hairs are standing in the back of my neck, you know, the, all, all these the physical response to, to the spirit of God. And so I walked around to the other side of the campfire where my, where my stepfather was. And I said, you know, I need to talk to you. So we left the campfire and, and I shared with him what I had seen. And he um, um, came, you know, he, he was basically beginning to tear up and he shared with me that the guy that got it revealed to him what the message was. And he said that the staircase represented time and that the man on the staircase was Enoch. And, and also I forgot to mention this at the top of the staircase, I had noticed a bright light, like a golden kind of golden colored light. And he said that the light was coming from Enoch city and that that the Enoch walking down those stairs was a representation of time that Enoch, the time was getting drawing closer and closer to the time when Enoch city would, would, would come back. Um, and that, and then the man in the center of the of the beings was Jesus, and he was reaching out as if to embrace someone. And basically, the message to me was that I needed to embrace him. You know, he was reaching out to me, and I needed to embrace him so that I could be a part of Zion. Um, and I, ironically, later on, I mean, we're talking maybe ten years ago, 
um, I had a, a whole new insight about my experience. And what I realized was that what I was seeing was the everlasting covenant. And I, I have that scripture pulled up um, in Genesis. So this is the everlasting covenant. This he's talking in Noah here. And he says, uh, and the bow shall be in the cloud and I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant, which I made with thy father Enoch, that when men should keep all my commandments, Zion should again come on the earth, the city of Enoch, which I have caught up unto myself. And then this is the part that really stands out. And this is mine everlasting covenant, that when thy posterity shall embrace the truth, embrace the truth, meaning embrace Christ, um, and look upward, then shall Zion look downward, and all the heaven shall shake with gladness, and the earth shall tremble with joy, and the general assembly of the church of the firstborn shall come down out of heaven and possess the earth, and shall have place until the end come. And this is mine everlasting covenant, which I made with thy father Enoch. And that's out of um, Genesis chapter nine. Um, anyway, so you know when I when I I never even put that together that Jesus was was you know reaching out to embrace me. You know that's the everlasting covenant that we look upward and embrace the truth. And once we do that, then Zion will look downward, um, and it'll it'll happen. Um, so that's that's been that testimony of that experience. You know, it has been it's one of those things where. I saw it with my eyes. I know it's true. It doesn't matter what happens from here going forward. I, it's something I can't deny. I, you know, um, I know Enoch, you know, and really these scriptures aren't found in, in the King James Version, you know, as far as Enoch City and all the vision and all that was, is all restoration um, scripture, you know, through brought through Joseph Smith. And so right. original canon of scripture uh, has not located this yet. Uh, and as John said a couple of weeks ago, we, we hang our hat all on Joseph Smith as producing that. Uh, but I, I believe it. I think it's a magnificent part of, of our gospel. Um, so yeah, that's, that's interesting Yeah, and, and unique to the restoration. Yeah. Well, the, that's nice that you have a, not nice. That's magnificent that you have a testimony and it was explained to you that way a confirmation that that maybe that portion of the inspired version is is legit and is uh was a i don't know call it a prophecy or a revelation given to joseph and that guy confirmed that to you mm -hmm. yeah so that's been you know i've had some rough times through in, in life since that time and and that's definitely been a, a you know a, a um, foundation that i've been able to hold to because it's not something i could have produced on my own. It's not something somebody convinced me of it. You know, I just witnessed it. So, right. um, and then I guess moving forward, you know, um, I, as I got older, you know, I, I was always, you know, I knew that I had a work to do. I knew that I needed to be about my father's business. And, uh, so in, um, let's see, I guess I was probably 17 or 18. Um, I went to, uh, I had an opportunity to go to the Pinyon, Arizona, um, you know, on the Navajo reservation, um, with, with brother George Allen. And he had gone there to do missionary work. And this is before, I think they hadn't even started doing the, they were doing, I guess at one point they did, um, reunions and stuff, but this was early on, I think it was maybe his second trip there. Um, but I was a young man and we went to church together and I was really excited to, to be able to go with him. So I went with him for a couple of weeks and I had an experience there as well. Um, we were one morning, I, we got up real early, the sun, we were sleeping in a tent out in the desert, you know, and so the, it's freezing cold all night. And then when the, when the sun comes up, the second it hits your tent, you know, it's like, feels like a hundred degrees in there, you know? So I, so I woke up early with the sun and went out to pray, went up on a plateau and it was really neat because there was broken pottery and ruins, you know, of wow. some old, some old civilization. And uh, anyway, I, I knelt down among those, among those ruins and, at that time, I was I was I think I was seventeen, maybe eighteen, and I was looking into college and trying to figure out what to do with my myself career wise. So I asked God I, in my prayer. I said, you know, can you give me some guidance because I, you know, I'm about to graduate high school. I don't really have any kind of direction. Um, you know, what what do you want me to do with my life? And I heard a voice, and it was not. He did not say what I expected him to say. You know, expected like, you know, go to this college or, or, you know, engage in this, learn this career, whatever. But the voice said, feed my sheep. 
And that was not what I expected to hear, you know, and, and I wasn't even in the priesthood, so I wasn't really sure how that was going to come about, but um, it, it was definitely an, an eye opener of where my priorities needed to be, you know, that feed his sheep and the rest will, will fill in in time. And um, so shortly thereafter, I was called a priesthood. I was called it. I would attended Buckner restoration branch at the time was called as a priest. And um, went, and then there probably a year after that, I had the opportunity, actually I had a dream about Honduras. And that's kind of how I got into that ministry. I was, I think I was 19 when I went to Honduras, 19 or 20. Um, <clears throat> but I had switched and started attending uh, when the school, when CPRS was created, I started attending Waldo. And um, at that, that's when I had an experience one night, I woke up around about three in the morning um, and I'd had this dream and it was really powerful and, and, you know, woke up like sweating and, you know, in tears. And I mean, it got, it really, it touched me. And so in this dream, um, I saw a, um, I saw a lake, like a lake scene with jaggedy, real jagged mountains in the background. I remember thinking those are some really sharp looking mountains. They weren't like typical Colorado type mountains. And, um, and so I'm looking into the water and I watch a young girl, dark skin, you know, walking out into the water and I walk out there behind her and we both turn around and I'm on the shore watching myself out in the water. And, uh, she, we both turn around and I baptize her and I, I just, you know, and then I woke up after seeing her being baptized and, and I thought, who is this girl and wh where was I? And, you know, what was this dream all about? And but I knew it had to be spiritual, but I didn't know what to do with it. Um, I don't know, six or eight months later, I was attending a, uh, a reunion and one of the brothers was sharing testimonies from Honduras um, that, that he had, it was involved. It was a Bob Bunch. He had a, a, a book of pictures that he was showing of Honduras and he was flipping pages. And, and I looked at it and saw that lake. Oh, wow. it, I mean, it was like the scene that, I, you know, minus me not being in it, but this lake was the exact lake and it's Lake Yehoa, which uh, if you know anything about, about like La Buena Fe and um, um, I forgot the name of the family right now, but um, the Bloom and Shines. Um, that was the lake where they had built their mission and um, back in the like, 60s and 70s. And um, anyway, so I knew that I had to go, but I had no idea how I was going to get there. Or, you know, I was I was in college, you know, had no money. I was just, you know, college kid broke and uh, wasn't sure how I was going to end up down there. And through a series of events, the doors all open. I had they were a bus got donated they needed people that needed someone to take it down there. So I was able to go and assist with that. That was my ride. And then uh, the, uh, the church, Waldo, um, agreed or offered to give me money each month to help me, to help pay for me to be able to be there. And uh, so, you know, I ended up becoming a missionary, you know, it just sort of got thrown in my lap, you know, a young priest, which I, I thought, why would God send a priest to, you know, as an overseas missionary, you know, but um, the doors open and I, I couldn't deny the dream. Um, so I went and I would say probably within three or four months, I found myself in that lake baptizing that girl in that, in that dream. And mm -hmm. uh, her, her name was, was, um, uh, uh, just blanked out. Um, um, Ingress, Ingress Ramos was her name. And she had been, Gary Metzger had been talking with her and, you know, and I really didn't even speak hardly any Spanish at the time. I was still learning. And, uh, but Ingress wanted to be baptized and she and I had connected and as friends, you know, she was like 15, I think. And so, uh, she asked that I baptize her and I didn't even realize what was happening until we ended up in the lake. I was walking down the water and realized this is my dream, you know, and, and what sure was that realization? Know, like uh, it was incredible. I, you know, there's so many times in your life where you wonder, am I where God wants me to be? Am I doing what God wants me to do? And in that moment, I knew hundred percent that I was right where God wanted me to be. Because there's a lot of it. there's a lot of ways to explain away things, but this is a really hard something to explain away. Uh, a dream, then right. seeing the picture, and then actually being involved in what God knew was going to transpire. I mean, yeah, faith was, building, or faith yeah, confirming, I should say, maybe. 
For sure. And, and the funny thing was, is that we really didn't even do baptisms in the lake. Um, it's known to have alligators in it. Um, I didn't find that out till later, but, um, you know, it has alligators. They don't really use it that much. Um, there was actually the, the church was in a town called Suatepeque, and we have a baptismal font there that, you know, we, the church people donated and we built to do baptisms. But um, there were people up near the lake that wanted to get baptized at the same time as this as this girl did. And so we, we combined it together and had the baptism up near where the people lived. Rather, instead of bringing everybody to, to Suatepeque, which was, you know, a, I don't know, 30 or 40 minute drive away. Um, so, yeah, so the, the scenario was just set up completely by God. It was, it mm. was just amazing. Um, so that was, that was a, a, you know, I had a lot of other really great testimonies in Honduras. Um, but interestingly enough, Gary took a picture of me in the water with her being baptizing her. And that, picture ended up on the cover of restoration voice it oh okay kind of neat um but anyway uh so the honduras experience was 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 great i made a lot of good connections there how long um, were you there i was there for just under three years okay yeah i learned spanish and you know made lots of connections with the people and <clears throat> so then i sort of i guess i got a wake-up call I ended up marrying a Honduran girl and um, brought her back with me. She was not, you know, never, never knew anything about the church. I baptized her and, you know, we, you know, fell in love and brought her back. We ended up having two children and years went, years went by. We were married for 11 years and my life sort of collapsed. She, uh, um, she was having relationships outside of our marriage and, you know, we ended up, you know, she wanted, wanted out, she wanted a divorce. And I was just absolutely devastated, you know, and, and my own pride and my own sort, you know, I sort of, I guess I call it my, my golden child syndrome. You know, I, I thought of myself as, you know, missionary and I had all these experiences and, you know, I had a work to do and all these things that I had sort of put myself on my own pedestal <laughs> and God knocked me off of it. You know, my, my life, just completely collapsed. You know, my, I still had my job, but that was basically it. You know, my, my marriage failed and, and I, and I, I tied so much into that marriage covenant. I'm, you know, a strong believer that, that against divorce, you know, I, I think that, you know, it's a covenant covenants have to be, you know, taken seriously and uh, you know, till death do us part. And when, when she chose to, to leave, it would just devastate me. And so here I was, you know, after we ended up, said we were separated for two years and here I was, you know, my wife is with somebody else, you know, my, my, you know, it just felt like everything had just collapsed. And, and that was, those, that was the time when my early childhood experiences, my vision and all that, you know, really gave me a foundation to make it through that because shortly thereafter, my, my stepfather who had been, um, you know, really an elder in the church, really strong, taught me a lot about the scriptures. Um, you know, basically taught me everything about the scriptures and he ended up leaving my mom and left the church too. Mm. And so all this happened, my, you know, my marriage failed, my, my stepfather abandoned the gospel. And I mean, he was part of my ordination even to priest, you know, and when all that sort of collapsed within a couple year period, it made me sort of step back and say, what, what do I believe? You know, who, what is my, what is my faith? What, what I know is true and what have I thought was true and isn't true, you know, and made me really look at my life and just be honest with myself, you know, and I kind of realized I'm not the golden child. I'm not, you know, some great, you know, Moses with a staff, you know, kind of guy. I'm just a normal guy. And I, you know, and my testimonies did not um, put me in any kind of category more righteous than anybody else. In fact, they probably were given to me because God knew the difficulties I would face in my life and, and that I needed them to make it through, you know, to keep my faith. It's a real honest uh, self-assessment. Uh, I don't, you, you probably don't know. I, I went through a divorce as well, married to a, a lady in a church and uh, you know, we were attending congregation um, and so you know, her, her family and my family are both in the church. So you have to deal with this, uh, conflict and, and not that anybody was 
was hostile to each other, but just uh, seeing each, you know, seeing at church functions and things like that. Uh, it was a, I, I can remember back on those times that the foundation and the shaking, um, everything you thought you knew all of a sudden was just kind of tossed up in the air. And, and like you said, what, what do I believe? Cause did you have, so I want to just, if you're okay, hanging out on this for just a minute, because yeah. for those listening that have gone through terrible um, tragedies, marriage breakups, loss and things like that. Did you feel at any point like you had sinned and this was a punishment that you had failed to see something clearly that God put in front of you that you weren't measuring up? What were, were those feelings there? Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I questioned whether I should even have priesthood authority. You know, I, you know, I thought, how could I have been so, so blind, you know, that I, that I made this covenant with this woman who, who turned out to not be a believer and, and was willing, you know, that, that my, my whole, and, and, and I, of course, I would not blame it all on her. I had failure too. I had arrogance and, you know, pride and certain expectations that weren't realistic. And, you know, it, it just, um, it totally tore me apart and made me question everything, even myself, you know, and, and I did, I felt guilty. I felt, you know, my children were, I, we had two children together. My children were suffering at the time. They were, uh, they were 11 and seven. Mm. They were suffering terribly. Um, you know, and I, you know, I couldn't help but think that I had run before the Lord. I had married someone he shouldn't, didn't want me to marry. And, you know, that I was now reaping the reward of my, my failure, you know, and, and I did, I felt like a failure. I felt, and I, I didn't want to even face anybody at the church, let alone act in my priesthood. You know, I just felt, cause I, you know, there is a stigma in the church, you know, there, are, and there, I think there's even congregations that won't even let you operate if you've been divorced. Right. You know? and, and so it, it, it made me think, wow, this ministry that I thought I was supposed to have is it's over, you know, I'm done. And, uh, and the grief, there's the grief, the heaviness of heart, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't suicidal, but I was just about as close as you can get to it. You know, I mean, I just, yeah. it just, it was almost like I would never do it to myself, but if God wanted to take me, then so be it. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? Right. Um, but I did have a, I did have a, a testimony out of that, but did you have something you wanted to ask her? Oh no, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, so one, one night, and this is probably, I, I would say in some ways, this is might be my most powerful testimony in terms of changing my heart. Um, I was, I was just devastated. Uh, my cousin had called me and said that he had seen her at us, uh, at Cargo Largo, actually of all places with someone else holding hands. And we were still married technically, you know, we were separated, but she was, had moved on. And I just, you know, I had kept holding that hope out that, she would, something would happen. God would answer prayers. She'd repent. I had people praying for us, my family, friends, you know, and I just kept, kept holding out hope that she would change. Her heart would change. And th we'd been separated for probably a year and a half, you know, or so. And when he told me that he saw her holding hands and cuddled up with somebody else, I just, I just couldn't believe that could be possible. And my heart ached so bad, you know, and I, so I, when I heard that, I, you know, I got off the phone and I'd been kind of a recl recluse anyway, at that point, I wasn't really, I wasn't going to church. I wasn't right. even really going at, doing anything. I was locked in my, I was living in my brother in his basement, you know, cause the, her and the kids were still in the house and mm -hmm. I just would lock in myself in the room. You know, I just, I lost my hope Right. and <clears throat> I was kneeling beside my bed feeling like everything that I had done was just lost. It was all over with. And my life was over and I knelt down beside my bed and I'd been crying for a while, you know, just by myself. And my, I'd cried so much that my, my eye sockets were dry. There was nothing coming out anymore, you know, and he splitting headache, you know, just felt just absolutely awful. And around, I don't know, two in the morning, maybe I knelt down beside my bed and I said, God, I, I can't do this anymore. I can't, I can't take it anymore. I, I please, please just take me home. I, can't, I don't want to be here, you know? And um, God, God spoke to me and I had, hadn't been attending church. I hadn't been praying, you know, other than praying for her to come back, but, you know, more of a desperate kind of thing and not really a relational thing with God. And, but I heard a voice 
And he said to me, he asked me a question. He said, do you believe that I created you to be her husband? That, that I was, in other words, that I was created for the purpose of being married to her. And I, you know, and I answered, well, no. I mean, why would he, he wouldn't create someone just to be somebody else's husband. That doesn't make sense, you know. And once, and, and that's all he had to say. And once mm -hmm. he said that, I realized, wow, what am I doing? This is, this is, there's so much more to life than a marriage. You know, so much more to life than this one other person that, doesn't love me because there's millions out there that, that need love, you know? And so how selfish of me to want my life to be over with just because of this failed relationship. And so that's an interesting. Uh, I wasn't expecting that. Uh, so he addressed identity, your identity, you were yeah. identifying as, as her husband and he's, and that, and, you say that I know you're not minimalizing that relationship, but you're saying that's that can never be our primary identity, right? Husband or father, it has to be son of God, child of God, creation right. of our creator. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, that was a perspective change I needed. You know, I just needed to see it from his perspective that when you step back from everything and you look at the work, you know, his work is to bring to pass the immortality of man. It's not to necessarily save a marriage or to, you know, you know, necessarily for an individual type of thing, his work is the overall picture of bringing to pass the immortality of as many souls as will accept him. And, and I was taking myself out of the game by my own depression and, you know, feeling of failure. I was, you know, I was up to bat, but not willing to grab the bat and go swing, you know? And, and, and so that's what made me realize that this isn't, this isn't what I need to be doing with myself. And so that was kind of my turning point. That's sort of, that's where I, you know, I sort of hit the bottom and began to climb back out. And um, at that point I started showing up at church, um, started, you know, spending time with friends, you know, started my prayer life again and just sort of on that road back to, you know, to him. And, uh, and I, you know, I, I'd cut him off and, and now he was, the door was opening back up to, to let him back in. And, uh, and I, I think that was probably, that was a, just a wonderful thing to have to go through. You know, off, it was awful, but yet it, it really made me see that I'm not any different than anybody else. I'm not, you know, that golden, see, so being an only child of a father that died, you know, really kind of built that golden child syndrome into me. And, and it was just a really good thing for me to realize that I'm, just like everybody else trying to make their way and, and, you know, make it back to God. Do you and, ever think um, like, do you ever think where, you know, where would I, how long would I have continued or how long would I have never realized that without that experience? Not that God wants to tear apart, apart marriages to, to get us to come to him, not at all, but, but uh, that he can use so many things and, and that he opened your eyes through this process. Cause think of how many things could have happened. You could have been angry at God. You could have turned your back on him. You could have, but you turned to him and he opened your eyes to something that's I'm sure led for you to be a, a different person and a better person. For sure. Yeah. I mean, I would never advocate divorce for anybody, yeah. but man, God, God is so powerful that he can take all those pieces and put it all back together and make it more, make it better than it ever could have been before, you know, and that really, you know, that really shows who our God is. You know, we, mm -hmm. we minimalize him so much, you know, we, we think, in, we think so temporary and, and temporal in our thoughts that we, we just don't understand. I mean, he's busy, you know, keeping planets in their orbits and, 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 you know, stars in the galaxy and everything else. But yet he's so intent on us making it home to him. You know, he's watching hairs fall from our head. And of course, he's seen a lot of mine fall. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and he cares about those little tiny things that are insignificant when you look at the world that he created. It, my, my issues with my ex-wife or my, you know, whatever. He, he fixes everything if we will just submit. And that was really the that was really the turning point was then I realized, okay, I need to let go of my agenda here. I had this agenda for my life, you know, sort of a, a, um, 
a plan that I thought was going to happen, you know, and following a narrative that I had set in my mind as the truth. And when, once that castle came crumbling down, you know, then I was able to really see what his plan was, you know, and I think we, we do that individually and we've done that as a church too. We've, we've set narratives up for ourselves, the way we think things are going to go down. And, you know, we're really setting up our own image of God rather than what the, who God actually is. You You know, know, it's interesting. You had that, you had a, a dream of you baptizing that girl and then you saw pictures and then you actually went and did what God gave you in that dream. That same God that knew you'd be standing there, knew you'd be nailing, you know, kneeling by your bed, having your marriage have fallen apart even before you met her. And he was there in that presence. And and that same God knows that the church is going to dwindle and, and be disorganized as it is today. And he knew that at the time Joseph was translating the the Book of Mormon, it puts things in perspective that that his hand is around around everything uh, as much as we feel lost sometimes. Yeah, the fact that God is is he's outside of time is is really a blessing, you know, for us because you know he's not he's not bound by not knowing what's going to happen next. You know, it's all present. He's all present, so it's all right now for him. Yeah. You know, and, and that's that's exciting. It's comforting. That, that should be our hope, you know, is that God is truly a God <laughs> of power and, and infinite wisdom and, you know, and, and outside of all of the rules that we have in, in the temporal world, you know, and that's I think that we all should take comfort in that no matter how bad things are, no matter how bad they seem, God, either it's part of God's plan or God is going to be able to, to get you through this and bring you out on the other side. How, um, so moving on from your marriage, uh, did you meet anyone else? Are you married now? I am. Yeah. You're married so, now. And, uh-huh. Go ahead. How many kids? Uh, two more <laughs> with her. <laughs> yeah. Um, we have a, we have a, uh, let's see, tw- a 13 year old boy. Cause I remarried oh, fairly soon about within the year. I, okay. I had, yeah, I, it, it's kind of, it's kind of a neat, testimony of itself, but, um, you know, God brought me, God turned that corner and I started attending church. We went to South Crystal restoration branch at the time. And, and, um, my, my wife, my current wife, uh, her name is summer. Uh, she basically was kind of in the same similar boat. Uh, and we just kind of ended up at South Crystal at the same time. And, and ironically we had dated way back in the day when we were teenagers we had dated for a few months and it had just kind of, kind of gone, you know, just ended. But now we found ourselves with much more in common and more mature. And, and uh, so we've, we just completed our 15th anniversary uh, just a few days ago. Wow. And, uh, we have, we have a 13 year old and a, and a, and a nine year old. And uh, it, you talk about complete opposites. I mean, she is just absolutely incredible. The, the hell meat. I, I could never have asked God to provide anything any better anyone any better than, than what he's given me and her. She's just incredible. And, um, you know, so I really, I'm able to see the, it's such a blessing to be able to see what a weak, you know, um, failed marriage is all about and, and sort of the minutia of what happens with that. And then on the flip side, have a, a successful one. Um, you know, and I think it helps in my ministry actually to be able to, to share what God what we should do, what God hopes for us, and then what, what he can do when we, when we mess up. So I've been very blessed. That, uh, yeah, there's, I'm sure you, you know, there's, there's a, there's some empathy that comes when you hear of other people uh, going through those same kind of trials, marriage and things that, uh, remembering the space you were in and, uh, oh, the inner conflict, it hopefully provides a heart that's, maybe more in tune to minister to someone like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, the, yeah. Anyway, I felt the same way. It was this, this, I'm I'm a loser. I'm never going to be able to minister. My ministry is done. Yeah. It's God is good uh, that he restored it to you and gave you someone to help you. Where did, uh, when did you move to Fort Worth? Um, Well, so in, 
but we moved here just in this last December. So oh, okay. I guess October, I'm sorry, October. Um, so yeah, so I guess in 2016, uh, my job, I got a promotion at work and they sent me to Springfield, Missouri. I was there for six months and then they moved me again to Denver. Um, so I was in Denver almost three years. Okay. Um, then I moved to Chicago um, and spent uh, two and a half years th- there and then now here. <laughs> so I've been doing a tour of the Midwest. <laughs> Do you have a favorite place that you lived? What's that? Do you have a favorite place that you lived? Um, outside of, outside of the Kansas city area, I'd say probably here, Fort Worth. Mm. Um, we've, we've been really happy here though. There's a, a good branch of people here. Not, not a lot, but good people and really been enjoying being here. Um, the politics are a little bit better here and from our, our politics, right. uh, we tend to be more conservative. So we were excited about that. Um, it was tough to be in Chicago. I spent all of COVID pretty much in Chicago. Uh, that was a rough place to be with the riots and the general, you know, fear and just everything going on there. It was, that was a tough place to live. <laughs> and right. I worked there and I worked the, uh, the computer, commuter, I worked for the railroads. I worked for, I did the oh. commuter, did the commuter trains. So the metros that run from Aurora, Illinois down into Chicago and back. And so I lived in Chicago, you know, close to downtown and, um, I had to work at Union Station right downtown. So we saw buildings being boarded up and graffiti and just, you know, the ugliness. Oh, we said yeah. we had 60,000 passengers a day walk right by us. So we were right in the heart of all of that when COVID went down. So that was, that was rough. <laughs> I do home health for, uh, I'm a home health nurse for a children's hospital here in Kansas city. And, uh, I had, we had rioting here in the evening, uh, at nighttime, really bad. And I had a couple of patients that were like within the same block and right off where they were going down. And it was so odd to walk around the neighborhood during the day and people are out about and you're saying hi to different people of different races and everybody's normal. And then all of a sudden it's like this movie turns on at night when the, when the sun goes down, like it was so, it was so not the experience of the everyday people living there. Uh, it was just it was really odd, really odd. Yeah. 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 Well, um, any other testimonies that, that you want to share? I, I mean, I've got some talking points, but, uh, I want to hear from you if, if there's anything else on your heart right now you want to share. Or... Um, well, so I guess just one other one, and, and I don't know if it's, a, it's not necessarily a huge testimony, but it has really been sort of leading my mind a different direction since remarrying and, and then, you know, what's happened after that. I was called to the office of elder, um, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago at South Chrysler. Um, and around that time, maybe a little bit before that time, um, I was reading in the book, the book Mormon in ether and, and I have it pulled up. I was going to share that real quick. Um, this is out of ether, uh, one verse 68. And it says, and it came to pass when the brother of Jared had said these words, now, this is when he had the stones and he molten out of the out of the rock, had them all laid out before God and wanted light to, in the barges or in the boats. And it says, and it came to pass that when the brother Jared had said these words, behold, the Lord stretched forth his hand and touched the stones one by one with his finger. And so I asked, I asked God, why, why did you have, why did you include the fact that it was one by one? You know, what? What about one by one? What, why put that in there? Why not just say you, you reached out and they all lit up, you know? Hmm. And the spirit filled my mind and said, because this is how I work with my people. This is how I'm going to endow my people. And that has really rang true with me in terms of, you know, this gospel is individual. And I think part of the problem that we have had in the restoration clear back to Joe Smith's day. I mean, this is not, you know, if you could, a lot of times I think we look back to like pre-84 and we think that's okay because we were the RLDS back then, but really there was tons of issues then, you know, with our doctrine and with our, the way we thought about Zion and all that. Um, You could stretch it back to 1925 with supreme directional control. And, you know, that was another big turning point in the church. Um, You know, and then you could stretch it back to the organization, back to 1844 with the death of Joseph. And really, you find all these issues, and really, it all leads back to the fact that we're we we are 
sort of putting all of our eggs in the basket of the organization, you know, and instead, and I think that many people, if they're really honest with themselves, are thinking in terms of, you know, that we're just waiting for Zion to happen. You know, a lot of people have gathered independence with the thought that, okay, I'm here, you know, I'm ready. Let's, you know, it's like we're waiting on a bus to come, you know, and, and I think that has been our downfall because we're, we're waiting, we're sort of waiting, thinking that we're being patient, thinking that we're enduring to the end, but we're actually not working on our own personal spiritual life at all. You know, we think that maybe attending church and, you know, being involved in, you know, youth group or teaching a class or something like that, that that's now we're just enduring until it happens. And I, and I think that we are failing and, you know, the, the early saints, um, you know, back in, in Joe Smith's time, we're so focused on the idea of building Zion and the organization that I think a lot of people went without carrying the fruits of the spirit in their hearts. You know, they weren't working on themselves. And that was evident in the fruits of what would like when they came to Missouri, you know, a lot, they were preaching that this is the land of Zion where this is our inheritance. We're, you know, we're building Zion here. And the locals were like, they had tamed that land. They had run the Indians off and they had cut the trees down and, and had the fields and the fencing and the houses. And they're, they're this group of religious people come in and say, we're, we're going to take all this and build Zion. You know, they, they were not happy about that, which is understandable. I call it the chosen itis syndrome. Uh, <laughs> it's like, it's like the church was the golden boy, right? Like, like you grew yeah. up kind of thinking we're, we're the chosen people. And uh, there's that little bit of swagger and, and, you know, right. confidence, maybe false confidence in, in your God that he likes you just a little bit better than your neighbors. And right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that that whole idea that we're the true church, you know, and we, we put a lot of stake in that thought process. And I think it leads to pride. You know, it leads to it's led to our failure. And so when you think about what that scripture says about that, he touched the stones one by one. I think that this gospel is supposed to be individual. I work on me. I work on my walk with God. And as he gives me strength, I share it with you. I share it with others. And you do the same thing. You work on your walk with God. And at, and at one point, we get to the point, spiritually speaking, that we are a true strength to one another. And that's how a congregation should function. But if that's, God, we, go ahead. Oh, sorry. That's, that's really uh, important and interesting because, uh, well, I think in the church, there could be pushback from that, you know, this personal savior, this personal relationship, because we're all about Zion and building a community. And that's what differentiates us from the Protestants. Uh, But it's quite, it's a simple concept. How do you share with somebody something that you don't have? And I'm talking about a a, a changed heart, a, a, just a love, a huge love for Jesus. How do you share that with someone when you don't have it? And, um, tying into this one thing i've learned from talking to to some of my lds brothers and their church even more so the one true church the culture the the ordinances that lock them into eternal salvation they there's an awakening there you've you've listened to some of the Mm -hmm. um they they realize that uh, it becomes a life, they say, a life of consumerism. Like once you've been endowed in the temple and you've arrived, you're just waiting out your time until the next life, and there's no growth. And that true happiness and uh, and contentment comes from growth and growing in, in the knowledge of the Lord and Jesus. So, yeah, that's uh, – well, continue on, yeah, about the, the difference between that. Yeah, well, and, and, I, and to make a comment on what you said about the LDS – you know, I, I'm so excited to hear those those guys on those different sites that you've you know you've listed and others that I've found just through other searches. It's so exciting to see them really look at their 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 history and say, wait a minute here, you know, you know, like make it like the Joe Smith papers, you know, mm-hmm. being able to see that they the Joe Smith's journal was edited and stuff was crossed out and added and all that. You know, and if you read it in its original form, it's the exact opposite of what they edited it to. You know, so it wasn't like they put in commas. You know, I mean, they were changing it. You know, Listen, did you hear that interview with Whitney where she said, I think it was her daughter was working in with the office, but they're like, she's like, Mom, they're releasing like seventy percent of his journals, and and she thought that was great. And Whitney's like, Well, what about the other thirty? Right. What are they keeping back? Right. Why? Why does there need to be secrets? You know, it's that that has that. 
I'm so really surprised that they're releasing what they have released, but you've got to wonder what's, what are they not releasing? <laughs> you know? Yeah. But, but it's very exciting. I think to be able to come back and say, okay, you know, the other two guys that were with them, you know, they weren't necessarily there as, as martyrs. I mean, they, you know, I mean, we, I don't want to accuse anyone of murder, but the, the signs all point against their, you know, goodness of heart based on what we know. Right. And, and I think that if you look at the, if you look at the lives of the apostles, the apostles at the time that that happened, and even some of the apostles before that, you see a lot of corruption. You know, a lot of these people ended up, I mean, I over half, like, I did. I was looking. I did a little study, and I think there was twenty-one apostles, something like that, from the time that of the church's organization until eighteen forty-four, and like thirteen of the twenty-one ended up in Utah, and most of the rest ended up either starting their own brand, or their own church, or joining with like Hedrickites or you know the Strangites or one of the mm -hmm. otherites, and very few ended up with the RLDS, you know, and and not to say that that's where they should have been, but you know the the idea is that the everyone was drawn to these organizations, you know, rather than focusing on your own spiritual life, you know, I, I really feel like people find safety and comfort in the organization. And I think we've seen that in the restoration branches. I think if you go to any restoration branch, there'll be some, if not all of the people that really all they want is to get back to 1983, you know, where, where you can talk about Graceland and talk about, you know, all the reunions and the stakes and the, all the get togethers and the, the organization having a 70 or an apostle come to your branch and the potlucks and th that sort of that, the attraction and the safety of being in those numbers, it, it's, it is attractive, you know, and That's I think, go ahead. I'll just say I drive around the city the metro area. I saw a church just the other day. It said, I think it said, uh, proclaiming the doctrine of the reorganized church, the original doctrine of the reorganized, the RLDS. And I thought, I don't want to do that. <laughs> uh, not that, not that there's not truth there, but, uh, I don't want to return to something that fell apart in, in any way. So, yeah. but. Well, and I, yeah, and I don't want to throw any particular branch under the bus because, you know, the branches often shift and move in their thought processes right. as well. But, you know, one of the branches I attended, uh, they had a policy that when you baptize someone, you have like if you're a visiting minister, they'll tell you you need to say this during the confirmation when they, you know, give receiving the Holy Ghost. You have to say that you were you know, that I confirm you a member of the church as it was organized in eight or as it was organized in 1830 and reorganized in, in 1860. I mean, you had to say that, you know, and I mean, it, aren't we receiving the Holy ghost is receiving the Holy ghost. You know, it, it there really didn't need to be a mention of any organization. Let you me know? pick your brain, uh, Shane, in this line of thought, um, what happened? Joseph translates this incredible record, and I've doing I've been I've done some research lately. Uh, I won't get into that. Just the translating process. I believe with all my heart he used the Urim and Thummim for every single word, and that to me it's like because it was translated once. It's like when you read the Book of Mormon, God has like put his stamp of approval on those words that you're reading. That it wasn't. It was a translator sitting around thinking, what is this Hebrew? What do you think this would mean? And they, well, it could mean perfect or or sober or, you know, and they pick a word and then you've got 10 different translations. It's like God told Joseph in our language this word and he would write it down. It, and I just I thought that is an amazing, amazing gift. No wonder he said this is the most correct. You'll get closer to God by reading this book than any other book. So saying that what happened because early on in the church i think 1832 it says that the church was under condemnation for leaving the book of mormon and in, in the commandments and and i think the first 15 revelations were also given through the urim and thummim do you have thoughts on that on what happened from the get-go other than just sinful man and satan and i i think it was i think it was again we were we were focusing on the organization you know, they were the early church. They only talked about Zion. So they're trying to get everybody to gather, you know, to, to build Zion. And 
but when when they used the term build Zion, it was really more about the organization, all things common, you know, sharing off of each other, you know, um, the, you know, buying land together, all kind of all these physical things, building it, building up a storehouse, you know, and they were divvying out all these priesthood offices to everybody, you know, and it was all about building this structure of of an organization and. And I think they missed they missed the whole message of why the church was restored, why why the Book of Mormon came to us. I mean, I I absolutely agree with you in in that the, the Book of Mormon is it's got to be the 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 most reliable source that we have of truth as far as written down by man. You know, the Bible we know has hand, gone through tons of revisions and lots of different people's hands and. And the inspired version is, is wonderful and I'm glad we have it and, and, and not to take away from the Bible in any way. Um, but the Book of Mormon, like you said, was translated word for word. You know, he wasn't like he's like you said, he wasn't given ideas and he had to write them down. He was given the actual word to say or to write, you know, and the fact that we have taken the Book of Mormon and edited it so many times, you know, like the the even the 1908, you know, we took out took out the, the you know, saying the son, of, we, or we added the son of, instead of just saying God came in the flesh, we we said son of God because it didn't fit the, the narrative or, you know, it made us look oh, like. That, that actually yeah. happened like seven, I think seven years after. Like, I didn't realize that that had gone out that far away. I thought it was much later. Someone wrote us, one of our listeners, and gave us the history of that. Yeah, not that you still can't get the idea, but that was that was pretty peculiar. Those yeah. Are- well, I don't understand why, if, if you come to me and you say, God gave me these direct words and I wrote them down exactly as he gave them to me, why would I think that I should go in and change any of it? Well, they would make more sense if he said it this way, yeah. or let's, you know, let's add some extra phrases because it'll match better with our other doctrine that we have. And, you know, I mean, you know, and then of course the night was it the 1960 authorized edition. I mean, whittled it down from 700 pages down to 300 something, <laughs> you know, I mean, it, I just can't believe that we would ever be arrogant enough to think that we need to touch those words. Right. You know? um, it, it would be like me taking my vision experience and saying, well, you know, let's, you know, let's take the staircase out of it. Cause that didn't really fit what, you know yeah. what I mean? It just, why would you do that? <laughs> it's been a ramp, right? The Jews used ramps for their temples, not stairs. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Let me go back to the um, so back to the your your ether and the finger of God touching each stone and uh, this personal talk to me more about our responsibility as saints in this because I know a lot of them feel like well what do we do if we're not if we're not engaged in something or trying to build something what do we do we're just biding our time you know tell me what what can we do as an individual that knows about Jesus and maybe isn't connected like they should be. Well, I think the the key to the focus that needs to be on our relationship, that's what God wants is a relationship, you know? And so there really isn't a checklist of things to do because you don't, you know, you don't have a checklist of things to do when you're trying to make friends with somebody, you know, you just connect. So I think the first thing you do is, is pray, talk to him, you know, um, learn how to listen, ask him to help you learn how to listen, you know, because he talks to us all the time. And a lot of times we just don't, we don't see it. Um, you know, I've always said that that Satan, in order to win, he doesn't have to get us to worship him. He only has to get us to not worship God, you know? And so what you do with your time, if you fill your time up with, you know, movies and sports and, you know, activities with the kids and you fill your time up with all these things that aren't necessarily bad, but they're, they are a distraction that you can end up squeezing God out, you know? You know, if you're only having prayer at a meal or prayer at bed, and that's that's all you talk to him all day long, you can't expect to have insights and inspiration and, and guidance throughout the day. I mean, I, you know, and I this is something I'm working on too. I'm by no means where I need to be, but you know, it. There have been plenty of times where I'm sitting at work, you know, and I'm typing something up, and then a, you know, something pops in my head, and I think, oh, I need to pray for my son, or I need to, you know, or or I'll have an insight and I'll put my work on pause and look something up real quick on, you know, on restored gospel, you know, uh, do a scripture search. Um, but I think God needs to be the center of our of minds. You know, I mean, it's so easy to center your life around physical stuff, sports, your kids, 
even your spouse, you know, um, your hobbies, your movies, you know, whatever your whatever earthly thing that it predominantly takes your time becomes an idol. And it and when when you have idols in your life, God can't be there, you know. Um, so uh, not to and, and when I say checklist, I don't mean you shouldn't do like prayer and fasting and study and those kind of things. Um, but I think the, the focus needs to be on the relationship. What can I do to spend time with God where our relationship grows? You know, experimenting on faith. If God, if you feel an urgency in your heart that maybe I need to stop, you know, whatever your hat, you know, even if it's like smoking or something like that, any kind of habit you have that you, you think probably is not what God would want you to do, experiment. Try stopping doing it. Try replacing it with prayer. You know, replace it with fasting. My wife, you know, and and not not to embarrass her, but she was a smoker when she she grew up in the church, and then graduated high school and fell the way of the world and chased the world for a while, and she spent ten years smoking, and it, um, you know, so she was, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say a chain smoker, but she smoked every day multiple times, you know, and and more than just socially once in a while, you know, it was a daily thing. And uh, she was addicted and she decided she wanted to quit. She quit multiple times only to pick it back up again. But finally God convinced her, convicted her and she realized I don't want to be a slave to this sin. And so she began every time she, she stopped and every time she got the temptation to smoke, she'd pray. And it just became a habit. Just pray every time, right? And right at that moment. And it was gone. God just took away the desire. If she didn't need Nicorette or any mm-hmm. of the other tools we have to try to stop, she just she did it through the power of God. And and I think that applies to everything in our lives that is an addiction or a, or a distraction. We if we replace it with God, you'll be surprised how much your life will change. You know, she doesn't even think about it. She's it's been well almost twenty years. And she hasn't even thought once about it. You know, so. Anyway, I think I think building that relationship is really it's everything. Um, I was going to ask you. I wonder, Shane, uh, would you be up for coming back for another uh, another part two? Maybe where I try to keep these around an hour or so, and I feel like there's so much I want to explore with you yet. Um, sure. How do you feel about that? That'd be fine. Yeah, it'd be great. Okay. I'll tell you what, why don't, um, any final words on this episode? And, um, I feel like we're cutting it short, but I do, I do want to have you back, but I want to talk to you a, a couple of things off air and see about wisdom of exploring some of those things. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm good for this one. <laughs> <laughs> you shared some tremendous testimonies and I hope, uh, I know our listeners will be blessed. This is stories of the saints are probably some of our most popular episodes. People like to hear real life testimonies that God is not just in a book, but working and living in the lives of people. So, well, thank you very much. We'll, uh, we'll have you back on soon and we'll pick up where we leave off. All right. Thanks for having me. Uh Uh-huh.